Welcome everybody to CCNA Connecting Networks version 6, chapter 2, point to point connections. Serial communications. So we've got two routers, we've got two digital modems, and we've got a high speed serial connection between those two, two digital modems or CSU DSUs. This is a point to point link. This is like a dedicated least line connection between these two sites. It can be across town or across the globe. But the problem is that the serial connections, the speed that they have, really, it was increased. It's been pretty much hit their max and we needed a better, better technology to be able to cater for the amount of data we need to move between two sites. HDLC is the default encapsulation of serial ports. There's a standard HDLC, which will only do one type of protocol. And Cisco, in their infinite wisdom, when they, when they incorporated HDLC, they put a little cheeky protocol field in there. But by default, the standard HDLC can only run the standard HDLC protocol between two routers. It's a layer two standard, it's a WAN standard. And because it's a point-to-point -point link, the address field isn't actually, has an address in it, it just has a flag. So that we know we've got a flag at the start and the beginning, but the address is also just a delimiter. So we know when the start and the end of each frame is coming past. To force the encapsulation type in your interface, you can say encapsulation HDLC, but it's the default for Cisco routers anyway. So if your interface is happy, it's up and up, layer one, the physical is up and the protocol is up. Down, down, there's no cable attached. Up, down, there's a cable attached and the interface is active, but there's nothing at the other end. And then we can have it looped or we can have it disabled or we can have it administratively shut down, like when we break out of the setup command. If we want to check the health and the state of our interface, and more importantly, figure out which end of the cable we've got connected, either the DTE or the DCE end of the cable, show controllers is the, com the command to use. Now PPP, point to point protocol. PPPs was invented because the technology between all the universities across America, they wanted to use different hardware. So what different brands of hardware, different types of hardware, they couldn't all speak exactly the same type of protocol. They had different versions of HTLC, different versions of X25, and they just couldn't get things to work properly. So we needed to create a protocol that would sit on top of the other protocols in order to move our layer three data from where it needs to go. I've put myself a little note there down the bottom, slip and trumpet windsock. Very first time I got on the internet, we had to fire a piece of software called slip, which was serial line IP address and another driver called trumpet windsock. And that was the only way to get TCP IP across our modem and onto our ISP. Thankfully now that's all been, all that sort of software is taken care of by the operating system. PPP also has a few excellent advantages over just classic hot HDLC and now we have authentication. So if using some sort of dial up or ISDN or remote access, you can actually have authentication. There's PAP, password authenticator protocol, and there's CHAP, challenge handshake authenticator protocol, sorry, authentication. PPP is like a big truck. There's a big truck and there's a, the truck itself, the engine, the cabin and the driver, and there's the, the container that hangs on the back of the truck, the, the, the payload or the data. So LCP and NCP, the link control protocol is the truck, the truck itself. He's the guy in charge of getting you from A to B. Whereas NCP, the network control protocol, that's the payload, that's the data, that's the information that goes inside that. So LCP has got a lot of responsibilities and LCP has to completely finish everything it has to do before the NCP is allowed to work. So LCP 
establishes a link, negotiates operations, it looks at authentication and compression and error detection, all that sort of stuff. The link control protocol is the brains of the operation and the NCP is the data that's encapsulated. So the network control protocol, multiple layer three protocols, IP, IPX, DECnet, Apple Talk, they can all go in there because on HDLC, it, you couldn't do that. You just had IP or nothing. But PPP has these two pieces. So there's the brains of the operation, the LCP, the link control protocol, and then the actual user data, whatever layer three format, is encapsulated into the network control protocol component of PPP. So PPP has three main phases in its configuration and setup. It's got four phases, but we'll talk about the first three. So we've got to set up the link establishment. We've got to do all the configuration negotiation, the authentication. Then we look at the quality, make sure that it's healthy. And only once we are happy that the link is fine and stable and authenticated, then in the third phase, our NCP will reach up and grab that layer three protocol and encapsulate it down into itself and move it across the link. So the LCP is all about establishing the link. It has management frames to maintain and monitor the health of the link. And if you're using something like ISDN, you can send a termination frame to actually terminate the link. The PPP supports authentication and it has built-in compression and it also supports multi-link as well. So here's a good example of the phases. LCP establishes the link. As part of the LCP, the routers can exchange IPCP messages and that just stands for IP configuration protocol. It's like DHCP, but it's the LCP in charge of it. So we set, it, we set up the link, we set up our ICP request, we get a response, and then the NCP can start moving the user data back and forth, back and forth. And then when it's finished, then it says, right, I'm finished, I'm finished. And then the LCP can disconnect the session. All right, let's have a look at how we actually configure this stuff. Authentication, compression, error detection, callback, multi-link. These are all things that are included in PPP. You just have to set them up. But to get basic settings going, you just need one command, encapsulation PPP. Put that on both ends of your interface, and now you've moved away from HDLC to PPP. The compression is on by default, but you can change the methodology if you with. And there's also a quality. Now this quality is in percentage out of one to 100, but you gotta be careful using this command. Because if you set the PPP quality to 100, and there's the, just the tiniest little bit of noise on that serial interface, it will tear it down and build it back up and wait for that quality to become back up to 100%. So I'd use the PPP quality command sparingly. Multilink is a very useful tool, especially when you've got ISDN basic rates, um, sorry, primary rate interfaces. So you can have router three and router four connected with an ISDN, and that could be connected with up to 30 64K channels. So rather than having 64 individual sessions, you bind them up into a multi-link, and that's how you get PPP running at two megabits per second. Now, I know it doesn't seem like much, but if you weren't using PPP and you had that two meg connection, you'd never get two meg out of it because it would be ISDN, it would be 20, it'd be 30 individual 64 channels. So all the PCs on the left and all the PCs on the right would only be able to have conversations with each other over one channel at a time. But when you bind them all together into a multi-link bundle, they all share all 30 64 channels and get the full two megabits a second. PAP and CHAP. Now PAP was the first, very simple two-way process, 
However, the part, the username and the password is the sending clear text. Plain text, if you ever sniffed out that traffic, it'll be just, you'd get usernames or passwords straight away. CHAP is what people use. It's a three-way exchange of a shared secret. So we get the password and we hash it and we send the hash across and then the other end ha compares the hash with a hash of their password and they verify that it is actually the same. The password itself is never sent, it's just the hash is sent from side to side. So to configure straight up, you set up your enable secret, your enable password, and you set up a username. Always got to have a local user database because it's this pap and chap, either one you use, they log in like a user. So notice we're on router A, therefore we set up the username router B or username lab B, password Cisco, encapsulate PPP. Now that will work, that's enough because the reason why we have the enable password Cisco is a legacy, a throwback to way back in the old days before the enable secret came along. So if you don't specify the username, it uses the host name of the router and the enable password. But that's a bit messy and it can cause problems. So we, the two examples listed are PPP authentication PAP and we actually send the username lab A with a password Cisco. But we shouldn't use PAP because it's old and easy to compromise. So we should use CHAP. And the biggest difference is that CHAP needs two lines. One line to send the name or the host name and one line to send the actual password. And there's definite labs on this, so they're very good labs to do. Now, remember, if you don't have a local user database or you don't have a name or password, PPP will never work. And also it's case sensitive, so that PPP chap host name with a capital L and a capital A in lab A, it's got a match at the other end with the username. It's also got to, it's got to match everything, case sensitive. All right, let's have a look at troubleshooting our WAN connectivity. Debug, debug PPP, debug PPP packet, debug PPP negotiation, debug PPP error. All very, very useful commands to see what's going on with our PPP. There's also another one, debug PPP authentication. If you want to see what's going, debug is an excellent tool and you should always target it as specifically as you can just to get the specific errors that you're actually wanting to see. Here's an out, a good output of the PPP authentication command. So we're looking at what's actually happening and it says unable to authenticate, no name received and then it says unable to validate chat response the username Pioneer is not found. So, I mean, it says the message, the error is in the message. So this R2 is sending a uh, authentic, is receiving authentication, but it doesn't have a local user database with the username of Pioneer. So you go and fix that up, add Pioneer, add a um, password and you're good to go as long as it's the right password, of course. All right, so let's have a, a bit of a visual representation of the difference between PAP and CHAP. So we've got this lovely river and we've got a watchtower on either side and we've got a road leading up to either side of the river. So along comes our lovely bus full of really awesome data we need to get across the road. So LCP shouts out, I am Frank, and then the other, other end says, accepted. And then LCP, because LCP is the link control protocol, it builds a raft, it builds a bridge between over the river between the two sides. And of course, it's all about quality. So it jumps up and down and checks the connection of the link and makes sure the quality is all good to go. And then once LCP is completely happy, then and only then the data can flow from one side of the bridge to the other. So password authentication, password is sent as clear text only once. LCP establishes a link, sends authentication, and the NCP encapsulates the layer three packets. However, 
Later that night, there was a naughty person in a speedboat. And they've got some naughty data that wants to get across from one side of the bridge to the other. So the speedboat pulls up and he shouts out, I am Frank. And of course the watchtower can't tell the difference between the watchtower and the speedboat. So he says, sure, accept it, no problem. So LCP does its job, builds the raft, builds the bridge between two sides of the river, does all its quality determination, and then the link is established and the naughty data is good to flow. Let's have a look at CHAP as a comparison. So once again, we've got our two sides of the riverbank, we've got our river, and we have our friendly data that we want to travel. So LCP sends out the username and the hash of the password, but now the other watchtowers are also authenticating back to us. Both ends are authenticating back to each other with the username and the hashing of the password or the hash to be compared to the password to make sure both ends are trusted with each other. So both ends are accepted with each other and they're happy with the authentication built up. Then LCP builds the connection between the two sides. Does all its stomping up and down, making sure that the quality of the link is all good to go and everything's fine. And then once LCP is finished, the user data is good to flow. So challenge handshake authentication protocol, encrypted keys to the passwords, not the passwords, but an encrypted hash. There is re-authentication at, at periodic times. LCP establishes the link, NCP encapsulates the layer three packets. Now, later that night, the naughty data comes along and the speedboat who overheard everything, he replays the Frank and doesn't even care what Bill has to say but he just accepts it and by some sh mad fluke if it happens to pass which is very unlikely but just pretend that it did then LCP is going to build the bridge as it does it's going to do its link quality check because that's what LCP's job is building the bridge and checking the quality and then the naughty data begins to flow but then the other does a re a re um, authentication check but there's anti-replay technology and it says no you can't use the same hash twice so it destroys the bridge and the bad data is washed away in the stream so the moral of the story always use chap for your authentication protocol when using ppp all right to sum up serial transmissions one bit at a time cool point to point links very expensive because they're usually a dedicated or a lease line. We didn't talk about fiber, but fiber is definitely something the Sonet using the ATM technology is very, very fast. And in America, they use the T standard. And in Europe, they use the E standard for high speed um, connections. Demarcation point, that's where your responsibility ends and, your IS and the ISPs begin. And the opposite is also true. That's the point of demarcation between you and your service provider. Cisco HDLC has, is a synchronous transfer method. PPP is synchronous, it needs a clock rate. That's why we have a clock rate on our serial cables. PPP uses the HDLC for the datagrams, but the LCP in the PPP is to establish, test, and terminate the data and has the authentication. PPP and CHAP, but you should use CHAP. And NCP encapsulates the layer three protocol down into itself and sends it across the link. Remembering that a WAN standard is a layer two standard. CHAP is the best authentication to use because of that three-way handshake. The password's never sent, only a hash to be compared with the password is sent, and is also periodic. So, and it has anti-replay anti protection in, built inside of it. And that's the end. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the next one.